Good morning. I'd like to welcome you. Uh, pleased to see all of you here. We very much appreciate um, your coming and uh, participating in this session. We also are very grateful for our speakers. Uh, they have both traveled a long way to be here. <laughs> and uh, we appreciate uh, the effort that they've made to come and to prepare their presentations. Perhaps I could first uh, introduce our two speakers to you. Uh, Sarah Lundi Jansan is from Mongolia. She is with uh, the Department of Registration and Alien Movement Ministry of Labor in Mongolia. She is the head of that department. Sarah holds a master's degree in public administration from the Academy of Management, Government Agency of Mongolia. Prior to that, she received her law degree from Tushi Institute of Law and Economics in Mongolia. She currently works for the Ministry of Labor and previously was an expert for the Standing Committee of Environment, Food, and Agriculture in Parliament. Our second speaker, speaker is Dr. Che Young Kim from South Korea. He is a professor of religious studies at Sogong University. Dr. Kim is a highly respected academic, author, and researcher. He is director of the Jesuit Scholar Program at Sogong University and is also a leading Presbyterian academic. He currently is president of the Korean Association for Religious Studies and has also co-chaired their joint conference with the Korean Society for the Sociology of Religions. Dr. Kim holds a bachelor's degree in English literature from Anjou University, a master's of religious studies from Seoul National University, a master's of religion and philosophy from the University of Madras in India, and a PhD in religious studies from the University of Ottawa. As I said, we are very grateful to have uh, these two uh, well-qualified and excellent speakers with us. Our program will proceed as follows. Uh, Sarah will first speak to us. She will be speaking in Mongolian, so you'll want to have your headphones on unless you speak Mongolian. Uh, and then following her remarks, uh, Dr. Kim will speak to us uh, in English. Uh, following both of their remarks, uh, we will have uh, lots of time for questions. So I'd very much appreciate it if, as they uh, make their presentations, if you can th think of things that are interesting to you that you'd like to know more about in terms of what they're saying, that you'd prepare some questions then that we can have them answer following their presentations. Uh, with that, we'll turn the time over to uh, Sarah for her presentation. Thank you. Yeah. Well, ladies and gentlemen and attendants, good morning. And uh, let me express my gratitude to be here at this annual 22nd symposium on the topic of religion, law, and social sustainability. Uh, around the 12th century, Mongolia has its own independent law. And Genghis Khan has a law named um, religious freedom for them. And so all the religious churches are free to be equal. And so uh, none of them will be dominant or more favored. So it also shows uh, the uh, religious freedom at the time. So since 1921, independence of Mongolia, there was the first constitution. At that constitution, there was um, all the monks and the religious beliefs, different religious beliefs. and. But there was no choice for the freedom to choose their religion. So, so at that time, the every third man was a Buddhist monk. So probably that's why there was a limit. But in 1940, there was a constitution. They expressed that they can have a 
um, freedom to choose what the kind of religion they want to believe in. And so next, the first, there was no uh, freedom to choose, but in 1960, the, uh, there was uh, the ch uh, ability to choose for their religious beliefs. And so in the Mongolian history, they was opened up since um, the, in 1921. So you can see that from our law. Uh, in 1920, 1992, democracy was introduced and there was a new, new constitution which proclaimed the religious freedom. And everyone can uh, have a right to choose to believe in something. And so a Mongolian democracy helped uh, that. And in the last 25 years, it was really opened up how they can believe and what kind of activity they can be involved in a church. So uh, there's a statistic research in, uh, in Mongolian Science Academy has the researchers that. And so in around the 1970s, which means before the democracy, during the communism, there was a research. And so everybody um, who involved with that research, the 80 to 85 percent says they don't, they are atheists and no relations with any church. But in 1994, after the democracy in Mongolia, and the same research, and also the uh, third of, uh, of the quarter of the participants, which was 71.1 percent, says they admitted they have some kind of religious beliefs and actively engaged in church activity. So from this research, we can see the people probably believed in something secretly and didn't really proclaim their uh, religious beliefs, but it opened up after the democracy. So let's see about the today's uh, situation. And so in a, in a capital city, <clears throat> and there's a research in uh, 2015 in March, there was a, a questionnaire. And so there's a, more than a dozen different religious beliefs in a capital city. And there's a, the actively um, involved with the many different social um, uh, people in the, in the country. So mostly the Buddh, uh, there's uh, many the Christian churches and 25.4% are the Buddhist monasteries. And there's uh, like a, uh, 22 different Buddhist church and uh, 72 Christian churches and there's a Hindu or Islam, Islam religion. There's a five different churches in them. And so there's on, it's on a website of the Mongolian government. You can uh, take a look if you want to. So how they get the approval of Mongolian uh, government? So uh, it's, there's a law of, about the relationship between the government, religious organizations, and so if if they want to open a religious organization in Mongolia, you have to get the permission from the uh, meeting of the citizens of delegation. It's like a board. And so those board members will uh, take a look at that. And so there's a, uh, you can request uh, uh, that uh, approval and you can have the certificate which is valid for one year and which can be extended annually depending on a decision from the board of citizens delegates so uh, the one th until three years that they can get the approval of the certificate so following so let me explain how they uh, uh, have ability to come and serve an mission in the country. So if you're a foreigner uh, in the law of Mongolia, there's a, the different visas you can request. If you are requesting a visa uh, from Mongolia, the religious uh, interest, there's a two different visas, ACH, and that is the visa for foreigners. Uh, so at the immigration agency in Mongolian, 
the Foreign Affairs Ministry. And so it's for 90 days you can uh, get the visa approval to enter Mongolia and also you can get the extension for 30 days. And the next one is uh, like uh, the f HG, which is that you can have work in Mongolia, have a job, hold a job. And so it, this, this visa is uh, approved from us, also same, the agency which I work for. So if it's a, for one year a visa, and so if they want to, or the, if the uh, organization requested, you can uh, extend for a year, another year. In in asodli wathara Mongol dosi. And uh, this um, uh, this policy was uh, uh, controlled by. Uh, the force, labor force exchange agency. The Mongolian is a the court system to uh, allows how many foreigners they can invite and they can how many foreign employees they can have. So the government uh, published a policy and control it that way. So on this part, the current policy says there's a very, uh, the, the percentage is very low. It's like a 5% of the uh, employees can be a foreigner or alien. And so just up to 5%. So if you have a uh, hundred people, there's only five foreigners can be allowed. And so there's a new 2016 uh, policy is working on in, um, uh, going to come out in November, so we cannot guess how many percentage it will be at that time. So, uh, and the religion is uh, become a very influential in the Mongolian government, and uh, especially the very positive results coming out. So, Mongolian government is looking into the uh, conflicts between the religious and the, between government and the religious feeling. I'm I'm sorry, but I'm not really a religious specialist, so I cannot really give you the religious information. But here's okay. Here's the there's a very the professors who knows about Mongolian religion. So th thank you for your attention. Sarah, thank you very much for your presentation. We appreciate that. Uh, Dr. Kim, thank you. Thank you very much for your coming uh, uh, in Mongolian and at Korean sessions. And also thank you very much for your church and also the BYU Institute of Religion and the Symposium. This is a very great honor for me personally to share my understanding of religious sensitive uh, conflict emerging in Korean society. Actually, traditionally, we don't have any you know, conflict uh, situations. Even though historically, we have some persecution history when first the Christianity came to Korea 200 years ago, and there's 100 years ago in uh, the Protestantism. And there was when Buddhism came, then the, also there's some conflict. But the very recently, uh, unfortunately, uh, emerging of the religious conflict issues is coming out. Yeah, even though it's not the large scale of the religious violence, but the very sophisticated and uh, sensitive uh, uh, the conflict of religious uh, in, uh, matters. Uh, in the name of uh, all the times mentioning about the separation of the state and the religion, especially the, uh, the American you know, things, so it is very, very you know, hot issues in, in, in Korea. So today I will talk about uh, how does this situation has been uh, changed in Korea. So the, my title will be about recent emergence of socially engaged Buddhism uh, in Korea. Usually the Buddhists, they do not care much about worldly affairs. Uh, and after more than the 500 years, uh, the ideology of the Confucianism, 
uh, prevalent in Korean society. So 500 years period, you know, it's really long, long, uh, you know, the ideology uh, controlling uh, society, politics, and culture, even all our cultural DNA. So even though uh, we don't have official okay, religious institute of Confucianism, but uh, when you go to the Korea, you can find out that, that strong trace strong cultural DNA of the Confucianism. So you can only see a Korean Buddhism as the version of Confucianized Buddhism. And also you can see Korean Christianity, Confucianized version of Christianity. And also you can see the Confucianized version of the shamanism, Confucianized version of other religious tradition, including your uh, Latter-day and uh, Saints. So among the uh, church leaders, uh, still the, quite to the Confucianized uh, version of the, your tradition too. Okay, so Confucianism officially uh, religious matters just the zero point two percent, but the you know five hundred years uh, Confucian ideology is still invisibly visibly influencing our Korean society, even. Uh, secularity, secularism, you can find out that only the uh, Confucianized version of the Korean uh, secularism, uh, public factors, both and hierarchical oriented uh, to some extent. Anyway, so the, I will tell a little bit more about the uh, landscape of Korean religious traditions. As you know, uh, probably know, uh, Korea, uh, 50 millions, okay? So among the 50 millions, more than half are the religious uh, people, but the quite luckily and also fortunately, balancing phenomena come out, especially Buddhism and also Christianity, including the Catholicism and the Protestantism. So the 22% is Buddhism, 80%, 18% is Protestantism, and there's a 10.8%. Uh, uh, 9%, almost 11% is Catholics. Then Confucius, just the 0.2. Then the shamanism, we cannot figure out because uh, we don't have the, any demographic the consensus about it. And there's NLM, new religious movement. Even the, your, uh, the LDS tradition is recognized as new religion in, in Korean society, but it's not uh, the... Uh, uh, calculated the numbers exactly, but usually Buddhism and the, the Christianity. Even the, our the symposium of religion and the law, the so basic assumption is about world religions, so-called big religions, even though the, uh, the, it happened in your uh, tradition-oriented university, but the basic assumption is about world religions in a conflict, so-called, not the small religious uh, tradition matters. But uh, I'm very wondering, how does uh, religion and the law and the freedom of law, how they have covered about the range of the concerning about the new religious movement, so many new religious movement in East Asia, and also you know, you know, in China, and also Hong Kong, and also the Taiwan. I think the, the, you know uh, numerous new religious movement so I'm very, very wondering how the freedom of religion issues has been concerning about these issues. Uh, so the only uh, until now, I hear much about the basic assumption about the big religious uh, tradition and their conflict, and their you know, the, uh, violent you know, context. So uh, traditionally, okay, the Buddhism has been playing a role like a mother Okay, even though uh, something happened uh, and uh, very, very negatively in outside, usually Buddhist uh, tradition, uh, they cared those things with the silence. So silence is a very important metaphor in, in Korean uh, society. Uh, sometimes uh, even though they felt offended, they do not say, uh, especially Buddhist uh, groups. So they just uh, take them, then they digest them. They do not care much about the, you know, the, external matters, especially caused by the Christianity groups. Okay, as you know, that the evangelical groups and those uh, little bit extreme, uh, the Christian groups, they 
say much about uh, their own the religious faith, okay, by force sometimes. And so um, even though they have done, but uh, we have quite a good mother, uh, you know, bumpering and filtering their uh, criticism of uh, Buddhism and those other uh, religious traditions. So, so quite the balancing. So Christianity is uh, playing really role as like the father, but the, unfortunately, some cases quite a, uh, problematic uh, ways. But uh, very, very recently, since uh, uh, 1970, after the Korean you know, democratization has come out, many young Buddhist uh, scholars and also Buddhist pro professors you know, trained in the West, not only in the States, North America, but also in Europe. You know, they begin to see how the Western countries handled you know, for the case of the criticism on the religious matters. They just import okay, their images of the Western in handling of the religious conflict in the name of the law. Uh, frankly speaking, I don't think that that is really the, uh, the rhetoric uh, or metaphoric, the handling of the religious in a conflict traditionally uh, in a Korean society. But uh, unfortunately, or well, fortunately, whenever something, uh, conflictual issues come out, law has been uh, coming nowadays. So I felt that this is, this is really big issues, a very near future. If we concern more about the, this kind of law issues, then I, I don't think that we can uh, handle or we can uh, really model is flexible you know, concerning and there's fathers more uh, critical self-reflection matters. Anyway, now there's this one. Then this has been sparked a uh, last government. Uh, you know, the last government uh, president is very, very faithful, a Presbyterian church elder. So the Hope Church elder. Unfortunately, he you know, the appointed almost 90% cabinet Christians. And also uh, one of these ministers, uh, unfortunately, he mentioned uh, strongly uh, concerning about a real, uh, Christian orientation policy. So many uh, mothers, like Buddhist monk, you know, felt very uncomfortable, but they still played the mother's role. But the young generations, especially young scholars, are trained in the West. They begin to raise the voices against the government. So why it is too much Christian-oriented cabinet of the Korean you know, ministry? And also why uh, it is too much you know, Christian-oriented things, this kind of thing. So uh, the Buddhist young uh, radical uh, you know, the groups, they begin to uh, criticize Korean government. So in that time, firstly, in uh, Korean history, a laity, Buddhist laity, combined with Buddhist monk. Usually Buddhist monk, they do not accept Buddhist laity's criticism of the society and others. They usually uh, take you know, government you know, policies. But this time is no exception. So first time in Korean modern history, we have a lot of gatherings about the Korean Buddhist groups then coming out and criticizing uh, the, you know, the you know, pro-Christian oriented you know, policies. But actually, in the content, it's not really the uh, Christian oriented policy, but because of, unfortunately, that cabinet uh, ministers, you know, the saying has been sparked for all kinds of images about against the Christianity and also against the assumption of the government. At the same time, in that time, one of the Korean high school, uh, uh, most uh, uh, Korean high school and the middle school, we are too much uh, also, uh, fortunately, uh, uh, unfortunately, indebted to uh, Christian missionaries. Uh, more than the 70% of the Korean the high school and the, uh, the, uh, the middle school uh, founded by uh, Korean, you know, Christian missionary, uh, Christian missionaries from the Western countries, and also universities. Uh, okay, so they produced a lot of intellectuals, still 
I think a Korean society is very uh, running by the Christian uh, intellectuals and those Christian uh, you know, the, uh, people. For example, the prime minister of the present uh, the, the Korean government, he is also very faithful Presbyterian uh, pastor. And those key members of the, and the dominant party in Korea, I think uh, really key engine of those parties are the Christians and also the opposite party also, uh, key engine uh, comparing to the Buddhist group and those other uh, religious groups. So in that time, a formal government period, okay? So one of the uh, uh, very well respected, very good, uh, the high school, okay, Daegwang uh, High School, uh, it is founded by Presbyterian uh, the denomination, and thus they produce a lot of good intellectuals, uh, uh, you know, and those government officers. So one of the student, uh, he is Buddhist, and those his mother, his family is all uh, the Buddhist uh, family. So this boy uh, claimed that I do not want to take, I do not want to, you know, go to the, you know, chapel. So he publicized these matters. Uh, you know, in outside. So many politicians, uh, uh, not only the opposition party, even though they are uh, Christians, uh, but for the sake of just criticism of the dominant party, uh, and also Buddhist young uh, radical laities, they accused uh, the, okay, the, uh, the high school. So this issue has been publicized everywhere, and those are some sort of uh, you know, myths has been occurring, okay? So what kind of myths? They say that they just give the ordinary Koreans about, you know, very myth of uh, religion matters in relation to constitution of Korean constitution, especially for the influenced by uh, what the American uh, constitution, simply the logic of the separation of religion and the state. But as, as you know, that it is very, very complicated process of the settlement of the religion and the statement, the separation issues. It is very flexible. The more I read uh, your statement, uh, your you know, constitution, then I, I find that it is very, very difficult, very, very uh, the, uh, seasoned with the uh, uh, things. But the, in Korea, you know, they simply say that religion matters should not be in the public sector. And those religion matters should not be in the even mission schools. For the case, they get the fund. But the, as I said, more than 70% are the Christian missionary foundation, a university, or the middle and the high school. So in reality, in reality, it's very difficult to change this whole landscape of it. But the unfortunately, very simple logic came that the separation of state and religion influenced Korean society established for the neutral terminology, free from religious nuance in any discourse. So they do not have much sense of the flexible creative space. How can we more healthy way uh, creating a religious cultures in Korea, as uh, previous, you know, the Korean uh, tradition has mentioned. Even though uh, the, the Christians has a lot of big mistakes. Anyway, this thing, so nowadays, you know, the young intellectuals and those Korean government officers, they say that the, the religious matters should not come out in public sector and those policy makings. So a lot of big uh, now this challenge, whenever something uh, related to Christian matters come out, then Buddhist groups say that, uh, why don't we get that fund as Christians do? So whenever something happened, Christian, the Buddhists are saying that, demanding, demanding, demanding. And those Christians, they are so much you know, offended in the previous you know, government but the, all the officers and the government president, uh, he is also the elder, so they did not say anything. They simply listened. But 
And after the new government of the present, the government, then they begin to slowly criticize. So among the intellectuals, they have very sensitive, invisible, but very possible, a strong you know, the field to be conflicting uh, each other. So this is very, very uh, big issues. Uh, then for the prevention of these matters, a former government, a minister of the education and those minister of culture and the tourism, they asked the Korean society for the study of religious studies. In that time, I was the chair of that to the, a program. Then they said very, very uh, strangely, sometimes uh, also very unfortunately, asked us to create one program for the prevention of religious conflict in Korean public sector. So nowadays, they are doing educate all public officers about the program of the uh, you know, prevention of religious uh, conflict matters. Uh, frankly, personally, I don't think that they should go that way. But just for the sake of the prevention, for the emerging you know, the reality. As you know, that the politicians are really politicians for the vote. So they really want quick, instant the programs. So unfortunately, we have to be involved with those issues. But we are now doing another big project, not funded by the government, but funded by uh, the, the, the neutral you know, the company, world companies. So this is very, very uh, difficult uh, issues uh, in, in, in Korea. So nowadays, uh, Korean you know, mission-funded university and also the middle and the high school, you know, they are really wondering what kind of religious education they should carry in this context. Whenever something unbalanced, you know, the uh, ideas come out, then students very easily accusing and also announcing and also even calling the press conference. So all these press conference, you know, reporters, they are very happy to have the exciting news about the religious matters and also Buddhist uh, radical riot groups also very exciting further about uh, uh, these issues uh, distinctively come out. So we are nowadays very, very uh, wondering how you know, the uh, mission-funded uh, schools and the universities you know, has been running. And also, if religious education okay, or religious identity matters has not been, uh, lo uh, has been losing you know, time for the education, then why we should run the, the schools and the university? So that has to be uh, respected. But the, these things is really uh, coming out. But, and also very wisely, uh, Korean high hierarchies of the Buddhist monk, they begin to realize that if they going that way further, following the radical laity groups, intellectual groups, they have also had to be challenged by their you know, mission works in the West. Because some Korean Christian groups, they, getting, they are getting some data, very empirical research data. Then they said, if you so, you should not involve with the mission works. And those Dharma-oriented uh, Buddhist you know, education or universities should not you know, the teach okay, Buddhist-oriented uh, religious education. This is not only the problem of uh, Korean uh, Christianity and those Korean uh, Buddhism, but also it is uh, influencing also other religious traditions, including uh, new religions, uh, uh, you know, the Confucianism and also many other uh, schools. So Confucian-oriented university we have, Confucian-oriented high school we have, Confucian-oriented middle school we have. So in this setting, okay, so nowadays, some of the, you know, the old uh, monk and the Confucian 
of followers and the Christian groups, they begin to awaken. Okay, that in you know, secularism, alternative way for the secularism has to be, you know, hold, has to be uh, reconsidered. But unfortunately, you know, those people who are in the uh, very very important policy ma uh, decision makers, even though they have, they are individually religious people, but in public sector, they do not know how to. And handle these issues, so they easily, okay, following the secularism, you know, logics, no more, no longer, you know, concern about religious matters. So uh, every Korean, you know, chaplains and also the uh, the, the mission founded the university and the Buddhist founded the universities, they are very very wondering where to go. Then how can we overcome these atoms? very strange you know, cultural ethos about religious matters. Then also we have another big groups oriented and trained in a national university. Uh, discussions about their uh, mission statement. But nowadays I am debunking logic, which means your mission statement is not the statement to be concerned and implemented in every uh, university, every mission school, because your mission statement is one of the mission statement. So your, sta your voice is one of the voices. Do not think that your voice is the, the, the voice. So we are now very strongly uh, suggesting about that uh, uh, logics for uh, Korean politicians and those Korean you know, intellectuals reconsider about you know, the uh, national uh, university. As you, I said, still quite good intellectuals, even though they are religious people, they are trained in national universities. So this is a very, very uh, hard issues. So th through this uh, conflict between the uh, the Buddhism and the Christianity, then the religious issues is coming out, uh, almost paralleling to the global you know, issues of religious matters uh, through the television and the media uh, things. Okay, so through this uh, conflictual uh, transition, many Korean Christian intellectuals they also begin to rethink about uh, their you know matters. Uh, so they are a little bit sensitive nowadays to their talks. And there's a Buddhist group also. They are not you know, further radically the demanding about uh, their things. Because you know, if they go that way, even the Buddhist uh, logic is not applicable to the general you know, senses. So uh, this is very, very uh, another uh, moment for Korean Christianity, Korean Buddhism, and also a very small groups of new religions uh, think about religious matters in public sector, uh, not simply reducing all dimensions of public sector into the private sector. We are now in the transitional period, how to handle these issues. But if these issues would not really settle down, but it, it will be a very, very difficult situation. But personally, I do not invite you know, restrict law, okay, uh, emphasis on these issues. The more we are inviting the law matters, I don't think that the, it will be really resolved. You know, we have to rethink about our you know, forefathers' wisdom, how they handle these uh, issues. Okay, how do uh, our forefathers handle you know, this you know, conflict uh, situation? I think uh, more than the law, I think it's some sort of very considerate the wisdom from each religious to the, uh, tradition should be, uh, in, should be reconsidered very, very for the sake of healthy uh, religious landscape of the Korea. Okay, thank you very much. Mm.
Sarah and Dr. Kim, thank you very much for your excellent presentations. We really um, appreciate those. Uh, are there questions then from uh, the attendees for our speakers? Any, uh, Shelton, did you have a question? Okay, you'll need to wait for the mic. And is your question for Sarah or for Dr. Kim? For both? Okay. Go ahead then. Yeah, I think, go ahead then, please. Thank you, moderator. Special commentations to the honorable speakers. Uh, for the speaker from Mongolia, uh, what would be the reasons for the board to deny uh, establishment of a religious denomination? And uh, shall I go ahead with the... Why don't we do one? Okay. Let's do one at a time. Go ahead. Okay, if you want to organize a religious organization in Mongolia, okay, you have to, uh, uh, there's no uh, limitation, but you have to uh, provide all the documentation they require, required, and it's, you know, if your religious organization is, uh, wanted to organize how many uh, founder like a one or more than one all those information on the on the founders and if there's a more than one founder in there there's a, you have to have a decision of from your meeting and also the uh, the letter the expressing a desire to organize the religious organization and the how you're going to meet, where you're going to meet, and if you have a, a building or facility to meet, and from that uh, board meeting, and if there is no uh, nothing against the Mongolian law, you will get the permission, and after that there is a registration uh, office, and you can get, take that to the to the office, and you will have get the certificate. Uh, if you say that this, the, uh, there's a forbidden things, so there's there's just very few um, uh, items that we forbid, and so you cannot force somebody to your religion. That's a forbidden. Follow through question, if I may. In your constitution, is there provision for freedom of religion? In 1992, there's in a constitution, it says uh, you, are, you can choose to uh, worship or not to. It's your right. So there's a relationship between the government and the religion, and there's a, the policy. And so in the policy it says, like, government will respect the, all the religion, and religion should follow the government uh, policies. To make it short, do you have uh, constitutional provisions for freedom of religion, yes or no? Thank you. Oh, no, no. <laughs> It's a uh, uh, All the people in a country have a right to believe. That's the that's the um, law policy. Thank you, Dr. Kim. Come, Samita, for the excellent presentation. I'm a Protestant, so I'm curious to learn from you why the Protestants were persecuted when they started to uh, introduce their relation into Korea. Uh, 
thank you very much for your uh, questions, Senator. You know that there are many uh, things. I think that, as I told you, that the Confucian ideology for almost 500 years, okay? So this ideology does not want you know, other foreign element to be in because that is really breaking the sustainability and the social, social sustainability because they may lose. Okay, they are quite afraid about it. And also, uh, the other thing is that uh, the many the, the slavers in the time and also non-aristocratic you know, groups, they have a lot of desire uh, to have the book only given to the small aristocratic confessions. Because uh, uh, pre preserving the book means you are a very privileged human being, not only personally, but also socially. Okay, so book is not handed to the lower class groups. But the Christian missionaries, they give them free in a booklet. Of course, no more nowadays because uh, everybody can have the book. But the, traditionally, we have a very strong desire to get the book. And also that is another you know, passionate zeal for Koreans to be fully engaged, involved in education, sometimes more you know, quite, you know. I, I am pleased to note that uh, South Korean people are very religious, not North Korea, South Korea. Make that point clear. Thank you for that. Uh, is there a mother or national religious denomination in Korea? Uh, we do not recognize uh, the national you know, religion, but unfortunately, this is very, very unfortunate. Uh, uh, parliament, they passed you know, official uh, religions uh, which can be recognized in the, uh, the Buddhism, uh, Protestantism and Catholicism, and the folk, the national folk religion, and uh, the Confucianism, then the uh, the one the, uh, the Eastern learning religion. Unfortunately, those six religions, whenever religious issue come out, are invited, but the other minor religions, they are not invited officially, so. Unification Church, they initiated to uh, you know, establish one group. So I think that the, that is also a very big mistake for the other minor religious traditions to be joined there, because it is if that going that way, then the, the you know, initiative, you know, Unification Church images has been transmitting. Uh, so. Those, uh, you know, the marginal, small religious groups, uh, they want to, you know, show, uh, you know, they are their existence in Korea. But also, you know, concerning of North Korea, North Koreans, uh, you know, in the last six years, you know, they just a different ideology. But I think, how can we ignore, you know, more than the 2,000, you know, more than, the, you know, 3,000 years, you know, Korean spirituality to their heart? 60 years, just a short. And those whole system of the Korean, North Korean you know, political ideology, I interpret that ideology as a sort of a new religious movement, you know, transmitting you know, worships of their dictators. Yeah. So I uh, have uh, done some researches uh, on the political ideology in North Korea as a sort of new religious you know, movement. Finally, uh, Mr. Moderator, uh, among other important things you made mention in your uh, uh, presentation, uh, appearance of discrimination for the educational institutions uh, of funding. Uh, if you can make me to better understand what prompted the discriminatory and the disbursement of funding? This is, this is a very, very complicated issue. Okay. Um, unfortunately, fortunately, I'm involved with the funding policies too. Uh, you know, definitely, you know, the very, very good research project from the Christian groups. 
but we have to balance. So unfortunately, almost equal fund given to the Buddhist groups. You know, this is very, very pity. So we have to decide which project you know, is really good. But the, the unfortunately, you know, social, you know, the religious culture push us to de uh, decide. Sometimes it's, it is a very uh, conscious you know, conflict, frankly speaking. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Are there other questions then for our speakers? Yes, uh-huh. Please, Joseph. My question is for both speakers. I was curious if you know, what is the extent of activity by Koreans in Mongolia in missionary or conversion work? And for Tsar and Tsitsik in particular, how does that affect your work from a practical, from a government perspective? Are you asking about the? Are you talking about the Korean religious organizations in Mongolia? Uh, uh, basically, there are many citizens um, uh, from Korea comes to Mongolia, and they usually comes the permission by the uh, S. As, as a Christian, Christian churches, I don't know exactly what kind it is, but uh, there is a permanent activities uh, going on in Mongolia. So from the information for requesting a visa is the most like charitable uh, activities are going on in Mongolia. So there as many Korean citizens request that permission. And so if as far as it's a legally uh, requested, well, there was no um, uh, limitation, so we can uh, give them permission. But there is the limitation only for how many citizens from the certain country can come in. So also they then won't be no more than 1% of the Mongolian uh, uh, population. So Mongolia only have a uh, three million people. So the, the, the no more than thirty thousand people can cannot come from this certain country. That's the limitation. Thank you uh, for your question. Uh, uh, here is another issue that we have to reconsider about to the conversion. Okay, because freedom of a religion. Uh, sometimes you know it nuanced, okay, a negative connotation of the conversion uh, uh, things. But I think that the authentic religious people and those authentic religious tradition uh, has the core of uh, you know dynamics, which means sharing their stories to others. Okay, not only the the Christian groups, but there's Buddhist groups and those uh, LDS church groups, if they do not have that opportunity to share their stories, I don't think that the, you know, the existence of religious tradition will be really a problem. So why? And also secularism, they have their own stories. They want to also have the you know, con conversion you know, stories to others. That's why big issues here but I really think that everybody's stories should be respected and also shared and also listened. But the problem is about way, how. Okay? The issue is not the conversion itself, but the issue is how to share their stories. I think in the sense, of course I know that there are some uh, Christian missionaries are quite uh, you know, beyond the borderline, uh, about the stories, but the, uh, generally, according to my observations in Mongolia, they are quite well respected. And those I do not know, Mongolia and the Korea, even though I met the, 
the, the Professor the Sarah very yes, the day before yesterday, but I felt to the sister. But even though I know the Americans more than the 20 years, still some barriers, okay? So I think that kind of, uh, I think, uh, ethos seems to be connected to each other quite well. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank all of you for attending today and for your good questions. Appreciate that. Uh, we appreciate very much, our, again, our speakers and the fine job that they have done and for coming all this way and sharing with us. Let us please uh, close with a round of applause for them.